the president also reestablished diplomatic ties with Cuba, paving the way for the deployment of Cuban medical brigades to Haiti. This was a big, fat no-no to the West. They said, oh, hell no. Nah. He's doing this stuff that Castro would have done. You see now? This is the background. You see, this is why. This is how. how this is part of the dialectical materialism that we got to see. We got to see where Haiti has been in order to know why Haiti is going through what it's going through right now. Because guess what? This is exactly why Haiti is in the position that it's in. It is not necessary because oh, well, they can't pick good leaders. Well, as if black people can't pick good leaders. Get the fuck out of here. There was a massive jailbreak in Haiti on Saturday, and over 4,000 inmates were released by gangs. They overwhelmed the police, and now the inmates are in the streets. There was also an attack in the airport in Port-au-Prince as well. So we're going to get into this, and we're going to take a look at what happened and how this is all connected. So. Let me see here. It's getting serious, y'all. Make sure. All right, let me share my screen really quick. Not yet. Okay. All right. The stopped operating, no flights in or out, paralyzed by gang violence, like much of the country. A gang leader and former police officer, Jimmy Charizet, nicknamed Barbecue, has claimed responsibility for the attacks, saying the aim is to force the Prime Minister, Ariel Henry, to stand down. In an unusual move, the gangs are uniting to bring down the government, and analysts say this could be a turning point in a Haiti's already tumultuous history. So... From what we observe now is that the gangs actually want an ousting of Ariel Henry, who is the de facto uh, president of Haiti, because they really just do not want him in power anymore. Now, uh, if anybody knows, uh, I actually covered this last year, and Henry is a U.S. puppet. So without going, it is without saying that these gangs, and by the way, not all gangs are created equal within this situation, but the gangs, for the most part, do not want a U.S. puppet to be in charge of the country. Given Haiti's history with resisting Western powers, and ousting France, it is really in their blood to want to have independence. So, yeah, let's continue. The government gave us the weapons to fight with our brothers and sisters. Now we turn the guns against them to fight them because they don't do anything for us. Gangs have overrun two of the so where do they get those weapons from? And now they don't want to turn it against each other. They want to go against the powers that are trying to take over, oversee their country.
What does this remind you of? Go ahead. There's a lot of countries you can actually say. But yeah. They want sovereignty, essentially. Gangs have overrun two of the main prisons in the capital, releasing several thousand prisoners, including gang leaders. Gun battles are taking place in the streets. Prisoners have escaped from several jails. It's miserable. The crisis is getting worse. Everywhere is unsafe. I can't find clients for my taxi to make money to feed my children. I'm an old man. Nothing seems to be functioning here anymore. Thousands of people are fleeing their homes. Many are having to queue up to get clean water. Some tell Al Jazeera they haven't been able to find drinking water since Sunday. We feel discouraged. We're fleeing. Our children can't go to school. We can't buy food. How can we live in such a situation? We're fighting our fellow Haitians while we're the same Haitian people. The U.S. administration has urged Americans to leave the country as soon as possible. Canada has closed its embassy, and some aid organizations have suspended their operations due to the dangerous situation. Thank you very much. The Prime Minister flew to Kenya last week to finalize a deal to set up a UN task force led by Kenya to help restore order. That triggered this latest crisis. I have to be careful what, uh, yeah, I have to be careful about some of this footage. On the ground to help authorities restore order and the prime minister has yet to return. Stephanie Decker, Al Jazeera. So that's what's going on at the moment. Uh, there is violence in the streets between gangs and government forces right now. But there's something I, I wanted to share as well. So a lot of the blame is going up against gangs themselves. They're being blamed for the violence. But when you speak to Haitians who are looking at it on the ground, there's more nuance to this situation. So I'm going to share this as well. Let me share this as well. Let me see. All right, so let's hear what she has to say. Uh, uh, Monique Klaska, you you fo you focused uh, you said on the criminals in uh, uh, in, uh, in in uh, white suits or, or or in a in white shirts, but the focus in this uh, in, in most of the media coverage about Haiti here in the United States is on the gangs in the street. Are all these gangs the same? Are there distinctions between them? Uh, because some people claim that some are more. Uh, political uh, than some of the other gangs, especially, for instance, this uh, uh, Jimmy Cherizé and, and his group. Uh, the um, uh, How do you regard this situation on the street with these gangs? I am here to say that the government, coming from the UN reports that have said that the former president of Haiti actually formed the gang, and armed gangs. So since 2011, it has been a criminal regime that has armed the gangs. And now- Oh. So with that being said, that means that not all gangs are created equal. So some of that destabilization that's going on is intentional. Huh. Let's continue. It gets deeper. So 
since 2011, it has been a criminal regime that has armed the gangs. And now perhaps the gangs have felt stronger and they are going about in their whatever it is, their criminal business. But the point I am making is the government, people in power, president, prime minister, ministers. There is even a document from the Yale Law School Clinic and human rights organization in Haiti that said it's a crime against humanity under Jovenel Moïse, the massacre in La Saline, where 71 people were killed. So we are talking about a construct. This is not something that happened out of the blue. These government officers, as well as prime minister, president, and some economic oligarchs have financed the gangs, they have armed the gangs, they have given them even contracts to distribute food in neighborhoods, etc. So we must be clear that the gangs have been instrumentalized in the past, created, armed to terrorize us so that they could keep power. So now the gangs have gained their independence and maybe they have their political whatever. But I think the main culprit here is government that started to finance them, senators, a lot of them are under sanction for arming the gangs or for giving them money. A lot of the ec huge economic players in Haiti are also under sanction, even a bank director is under sanction, even though it is not the United States, United Nations sanctions. So let's be clear about this. There is no doubt in my mind about this, that the gangs with white shirts or whatever shirts and ties are also extremely in, a, involved, not only involved, but responsible for this. And the United States knows this. We have told this to Assistant Secretary Brian Nichols. We have told this to Barbara Feinstein at the State Department. We have told this to Dan Erickson, who is now at the White House. We have told this. The Biden administration knows this, that it is a criminal regime, that it is financing, that it is supporting, that it is helping to kill us. Well, do you think that the Biden administration actually cares about the Haitian people? You can tell the Biden administration that, hey, you are literally funding criminals all you want. They don't care. Look what's going on in Gaza. If they're willing to continue to give $3 billion a year to Israel for genocide, you don't think that it will not be above them to continue to give money to criminals in power in Haiti? in order to keep the area destabilized? You don't think that's... That's exactly what they want. We say it's enough. We need new leadership in Haiti. We need different governance that respects our human rights. This is unattainable. This is unbelievable. It is inadmissible. We do not want this, and we are into resistance mode. We are saying no. We do not want this, and the Biden administration will pay for some of this because there are a million five Haitian in the United States, and they are beginning to threaten not to vote for Biden. So vote elections are decided by a few thousand votes. So a million and a half Haitians, that means a lot. They must reverse course. They must. What does this sound like? What does this sound like to y'all? 
Does this sound like what happened in Michigan, especially in Dearborn, where all these people voted uncommitted in the Michigan primary? And they're threatening to not vote for Joe Biden in the general election because of the genocide that's going on in Gaza? You don't think that this won't have a bearing against Joe Biden with the Haitian people? Because guess what? They're going to do the same. Because of what's going on in Haiti. So, funding the genocide in Gaza, funding the genocide in Haiti, funding genocide in, in Congo by means of Uganda and Rwanda, right? So, now what? The thing is that it's all in Joe Biden's court, but we all know that he's just going to fumble it. You probably won't even know that the ball is in his hands. Les. Yeah, I'd like to uh, bring in Jake Johnston, also uh, the uh, author of the new book, uh, Eight State, Elite Panic, Disaster Capitalism and the Battle to Control Haiti. Uh, welcome, Jake Johnston. Uh, your assessment of the situation right now uh, uh, in Haiti and the, the steps that need to be taken to restore uh, some sense of safety to the population and an actual functioning government? Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I, mean, I think when we, when we look at Haiti, we have to understand some of the roots of, of what we're seeing today. And at the heart of this is a broken social contract, a state that is no longer representative of or accountable to the population and has created the dynamics, the, the broader situation that has allowed this situation to spiral the way it has. And so when you look at how to address that, you have to start there. And I, I'd echo Munich's calls to focus on the political environment, right? We can't divorce insecurity from the political environment. And you look at what's happening. I mean, th this doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? The, the armed groups don't seize control, don't take this without at least some um, willingness or abandonment on a part of police hierarchy and government authorities. And so to begin with, there has to be an acceptance of responsibility. I think one of the most shocking things over the last four or five days has been the absolute total silence from the government, right? Ariel Henry is not even in the country. The state of emergency was announced by the Minister of Finance in a press release. And so there's really just, again, a total abandonment on the part of state authorities. And like Monique said, you know, this is not a crisis entirely created in Haiti or by Haitians, right? We have to understand that this has been a long time coming and it's been a process stoked and perpetuated by the international community and namely the United States. Uh, you know, we could go back to Haiti's history, to its founding, first independent black republic, successful slave revolt, the US occupation, but we don't need to go back that far into history to see this history of intervention. The 2004 coup d'etat, the overturning of election results in 2010, and the United States insistence on moving forward with this current government uh, against all odds and against the very clear uh, expression from the Haitian people. And so unless that begins to change, you know, it's extremely unlikely that the situation on the ground uh, meaningfully improves. I wanted... And Jake, uh, I wanted to ask you about... So he talks about the history. It's very interesting that we get that background information. And I'm not going to play the entire video, but I wanted to get up to that point. But... Let's go into this. So, like I said before, Ariel Henry is basically a U.S., French, and Canadian puppet. And his goal really is to keep the area, the country, destabilized in order to control it. In fact, it was brought out that the CIA facilitated a coup to have more pro-Western, pro-corporate government stooge in place. This was revealed by the Gray Zone. So we're going to share this part. Uh, shout out to the Gray Zone for this as well. So this is out of the Gray Zone. It says Secret Cable CIA orchestrated Haiti's 2004 coup. So this is by J.B. Sprague and Kit Clarenberg. 
So this came out a couple days ago. So we're just going to go over this a little bit. It says a classic, I'm sorry, a classified diplomatic cable obtained by the Gray Zone reveals the role of a veteran CIA officer in violently overthrowing Haiti's popular president, Jean Bertrand Aristide, in 2004. It says a spectacular jailbreak in Ganaves, Haiti, in August of 2002, saw a bulldozer smash through the local prison walls, allowing armed supporters of Emwa Cubain Meteor, a gang leader jailed weeks earlier for harassing Haitian political figures, to overturn the facility. Meteor escaped, and as did 158 other prisoners, among them were perpetrators of the April 1994 Robito massacre, which left dozens of Haitians dead and displaced. The victims were supporters of the popular anti-imperialist president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Documents released to the gray zone under FOIA, that's Freedom of Information Act, no doubt unintentionally revealed that the jailbreak was part of a complex U.S. intelligence operation aimed at undermining Aristide's presidency. At the heart of this operation was Janice L. Elmore, a CIA operative working undercover as the Department of State political officer in the Port-au-Prince U.S. Embassy at the time. The breakout set in motion a violent regime change campaign, which ultimately ousted Aristide from office on February 29th of 2004. After being deposed and flown to South Africa, Aristide claimed that he had been kidnapped by U.S. forces and directly accused Washington of orchestrating the plot. His nation quickly transformed into a despotic failed state as ruthless paramilitaries ran roughshod over the population. U.S. Marines and later U.N. troops were deployed to keep the peace, which in practice meant violently cracking down on not only armed anti-coup militants, but also outraged demonstrators and civilians. So a lot of what we see as happened back then, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And it's basically a lot of what we're seeing today where it, it, it gets deeper. It gets deeper. So it says in 2022, the former French ambassador to Haiti admitted that France and the U.S. did, in fact, orchestrate the coup, which he acknowledged was probably due to Aristide's repeated demands that Haitians be returned the $21 billion in reparations they forcibly paid to their former slave masters in Paris since 1825. The former ambassador told the New York Times that with Aristide in exile, it made our job easier to undermine Haitians' demands for a refund. So when it comes to the when it comes to the liberation of the Haitian people, Aristide was actually in favor of actual true liberation for his people. And the West said, oh hell no, nah, you ain't getting shit. Because he was saying, you kept us in chains, you kept us enslaved. And then you forced us to pay you reparations for us ousting you, France, for enslaving us. Now we're saying, pay that money back because we were never supposed to pay you that in the first place. And in fact, you're supposed to be paying us reparations for that slavery that you subjected us to for many, many years. And for that, for that, they ousted Aristotle via CIA coup. See what happens? Oh, baby. Let's continue. It says, U.S. officials have repeatedly denied any involvement in Aristide's overflow. Of course they are. They're not going to actually admit to it claiming that they only intervene afterwards to restore order. But the secret diplomatic cable obtained by the Gray Zone tells a very different story. So, there go over this CIA operative, Miss Elmore. And so, 
this goes over the details involving her as well. And so let's go to this part right here. I just thought exiled supporters massacred in December 1990, 37-year-old charismatic Catholic priest. Jean Bertrand Aristad was elected by a landslide in Haiti's first ever democratic presidential election. Hang on. First of all, what does that remind you of? Doesn't that remind you of uh, when Mohammed Mossadegh was installed as president in Iran? Or when Patrice Lumumba was elected as the first president? of the Democratic Republic of Congo? Doesn't that remind you of that? Where it was sweeping, right? They really wanted this person democratically elected. Why did they want him? Let's get into it. Swept into, an, on, into office on a platform of democratization and national sovereignty Edistad sought to enact a form of liberation theology, a Christian philosophy advocating freeing the downtrodden via revolution. So somebody like him basically wanted to implement bottom-up policies for the proletariat while using his Christian theology as a means to do it. Basically, he sounds a lot like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. If Martin Luther King Jr. used his theology and then actually got into politics to fight for workers, that's basically what Adestad was. Interesting, right? Huh. Let's continue. It gets deeper. But just seven months after his inauguration, Edisteed, I'm sorry, wait, am I saying the name wrong? Uh, Edisteed was marched at gunpoint from Port au Prince's presidential palace by members of Haiti's US trained armed forces and forced into exile. Over the next three years, the country was ruled by a brutal junta, and thousands were butchered by the army police and fascist paramilitaries see what happens see what happens when the west intervenes this reminds me of when salvador allende was president in chile and then they ousted him through a coup and they installed Pinochet, and then they murdered all those people. It's the same song, different dance, every single time. Same song, different dance. This is, you know, the, you know the playbook. The playbook goes the same way over and over and over. This is how, this is how they do it every single time. This is why I can literally. I'm, look, I'm not that educated in regards to this part of history like I should be. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. But even I, even I can recall these things of how the United States has engaged in coups in order to take over and, and place in a puppet government in order to have that area for themselves. It says this reign of terror reaches Zenith on April 22nd, 1994, when the military and paramilitary forces attacked the strongly pro Aristide neighborhood of Roboto in Ganaves. Uh, Many residents have been participating in large scale demonstrations demanding the return of their president ever since his removal. In a savage dawn raid, soldiers went house to house beating and arresting residents, including children, while firing indiscriminately at passerby and those who attempted to flee. When the shooting stopped, at least 30 locals were dead. 
Robotol was far from the only massacre carried out by Haiti's military junta during Aristide's exile, but it did produce the very first trial for crimes against humanity in the country's history. In September 2000, 53 out of 59 defendants were convicted of mass murder for their role in the violence. Among them were the 1991 coup leaders found guilty in absentia. And the New York Times reported at the time the trial was a landmark for Haiti and a step in the bringing to justice the elite tier of military and paramilitary officers in their cohorts for human rights abuses committed during the period of violent military rule after the overthrow of the former president. It says, under mounting public pressure at home and across the Caribbean, Washington committed to returning Arista, Aristi, I'm sorry, Aristide's elected government on October 15, 1994. To ensure this, over 20,000 U.S. troops briefly occupied the country alongside the small contingent from CARICOM or Caribbean Command. The return of the elected government brought an end to the massacres. The Aristide government was finally able to begin reforming the police and disbanding the country's notoriously progressive army while launching school construction projects and other programs benefiting the poor. So as soon as they brought NSD back, it was like, all right, let's let the good times roll. Building schools, programs for the poor. See what happens? And that was because of public pressure, right? So it says, these projects continue after Aristide's successor, René Preval, won the presidency in 96. Through Preval, though Preval disappointed many of the popular movement supporters after appearing to embrace privatization, it seemed the country would be back on track when Aristide secured the nearly 92% of the votes in a landslide election and was returned to office in 2001. Who, wait, 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 beep, beep, back up the truck. Who do you know gets 92% of the vote? Nine, 92%? Who gets that? That, this dude was popular. Popular. 92%? The whole, the whole damn country wanted him back. But here, here, here's, here's the crappy part. It says, within months, however, U.S. President George W. Bush, W. himself, imposed crippling sanctions on Haiti, moving to freeze the World Bank and IMF loans. See, the World Bank and IMF, Tweedle D and Tweedle Dum while blocking poor prints from U.S. aid and development assistance. Washington justified the destructive measures by claiming there was irregularities in the election, pointing to figures in the country's opposition who boycotted the vote. Yet, polls show voters strongly supported Aristide and rejected the boycott. So basically, they were like, well, we're going to punish your country all because we don't think that your election was legitimate, despite polls showing otherwise. Why? Because they did not want somebody like Aristide to be a leader in Haiti. Remind you of how the, the West treated uh, Gaza after they voted in Hamas to be the government in Gaza? You see, they facilitated that election. The West facilitated that election to happen. But then when the Palestinians voted in a way that the West didn't like, then guess what? That's when it was like, okay, we're, you, get into the open air prison. Get in there. Because you voted the way we didn't want you to. Even though you used your, your voice, even though you did everything democratically, we don't believe it. We don't believe it. We don't, we don't, we don't like it. Oh, we want you to vote democratically. Not like that. That's basically what happened. See how it is? They thought that the people were going to support them, but it wasn't that way. 
they wanted full democracy and democratization. It says, undeterred, Edestead's government quickly set about mobilizing the poor, fostering neighborhood truces, bolstering healthcare and education systems, doubling, doubling, doubling the minimum wage while holding accountable paramilitaries and their financiers. The president also reestablished diplomatic ties with Cuba, paving the way for the deployment of Cuban medical brigades to Haiti. This was a big fat no-no to the West. They said, oh, hell no. Nah. He's doing this stuff that Castro would have done. You see now? This is the background. You see, this is why, this is how, how this is part of the dialectical materialism that we got to see. We got to see where Haiti has been in order to know why Haiti is going through what it's going through right now. Because guess what? This is exactly why Haiti is in the position that it's in. It is not necessary because, oh, well, they can't pick good leaders. Well, as if black people can't pick good leaders. Get the fuck out of here with that BS. That. It is the most. the most paternalistic BS I hear that we don't know what we're doing. We can't choose for ourselves. They're always taking away our autonomy as black people throughout the entire diaspora. And it's typically because they will replace who we have with some type of puppet. And then when the area stays destabilized because of them, they just chalk it up to, oh, well, they just don't know how to pick their leaders correctly. Those black people in Africa, those black people in the Caribbean, oh, they just don't know what they're doing. When in reality, who was the ones that put that dictator in place? Who was the one that put that pump in place? It wasn't us. It wasn't the Haitian people. It wasn't the people in Niger. It wasn't the people in Burkina Faso. It wasn't the people in Democratic Republic of Congo. It wasn't the people in Rwanda. It wasn't the people in Uganda. It wasn't the people in Ethiopia. It was not us. It's always the West getting their nasty ass, grubby little hands in our business in order to steal and take our resources because they know we're rich. They know we're rich, but they don't want us to know it. That pisses me off. They chose their leader. And they chose somebody that was actually for the poor. They chose Adistad, and the United States didn't like it. And what did the United States do and the collective West do? They decided for Black people instead of letting us decide for ourselves. And they did it to all of these countries that are majority Black. And not just majority Black. They do it to majority Asian countries. They do it to majority Latino countries or South American countries too. They do it to them too. They do it to the indigenous countries. Why? Because a lot of these countries have what we like to call resources. All right, so let's continue. Though popular among average Haitians, the programs were seen as dire political threat by local opposition figures and their backers in Washington. See, the puppets, the puppets didn't like it because they knew, Aristide, I'm sorry, 
was too popular. He was too good. As the Bush administration embraced the development assistance embargo, which successfully pressured most NGOs and other governments to cut off aid, and the National Endowment for Democracy, those dipshits, a U.S. intelligence cutout established to influence elections abroad, began organizing disunited opposition parties into a single umbrella group under the guise of democracy promotion. Soon enough, a violent paramilitary campaign erupted, targeting government infrastructure in Port-au-Prince before spreading to rural areas which strongly supported Levelas, a movement associated with Aristide. Amid the tumult, the spectacular jailbreak was carried out in uh, Ghanaves in August of 2002, and Medier was freed alongside dozens of paramilitaries and anti-government gangsters. So, this article also goes over the how the CIA really implemented uh, and chose Haiti's government, including in the drug trade, by the way. So it goes over that. I highly encourage you guys to read this article. And so you guys go ahead and take a look at this article once you guys get free time. But I I said all that primarily because that's really the history of how Haiti has been implemented as far as the public governments, right? So I put the link in the chat, by the way. So as we can see, nothing new has changed. But what about the gangs that are fighting against the government, right? What are they trying to achieve? So I'm going to give a shout out to journalist Stan Cohen. He gave some great analysis and reporting. So I'm going to share that as well. Because a lot of people do not know. People think, oh, just gangs. And they just say gangs blanket in general. When in reality, they're saying gangs, but ultimately it's not always cracked up to be. Because one side is a gang, and another side is called a gang, but really, I would say it's an organization. So let's take a look. So this gentleman was mentioned on Democracy Now!, Let's get into it. So this is from Dan Cohen. He says, the U.S. government and its media apparatus are telling you Haiti has a gang problem that demands foreign military intervention. It's true. There is a problem with criminal gangs that kidnap, terrorize, and murder innocent people. What they don't tell you is that these criminal gangs are creations of the system supported by the U.S.-backed oligarchs. Now, remember what that lady said on Democracy Now? Remember what she said, Monique? She was talking about how they are basically implemented by the Western governments, by the Western powers, right? And Ariel Henry is also doing the same thing as well by implementing these gangs. And because he's implementing these gangs, that's causing a destabilization, which means he's creating a situation where the U.S. government and the West have to send in troops now in order to keep the peace, in order to keep the order within Haiti. It's a creation of a crisis. Remember Lion King, right? Where Scar put Simba in the middle of that little valley. And way up on that cliff, what were there? All those wildebeests were there. 
Then what happened? The hyenas started snapping at the wildebeest, trying to chase them, and the wildebeest came down into the valley. And it placed Simba in danger. And then what happened? Scar goes to his father, Mufasa, and goes, Simba, he's in danger. Mufasa's like, what? The wildebeest, they're going to crush him. They both go. And we all know what happened in that movie. Spoiler alert. Because it was really to kill Simba as well as Mufasa by means of the wildebeests. But it didn't work. Because Mufasa's him. Mufasa was like, I'm him. I'm saving my boy. And I'm going to make it out alive. But as he was up there, he said, Scar! Brother, and then Scar did what he did. Boom! Long live the king! And then let him go. He fell. The fall probably was what killed Mufasa. But on top of that, the wildebeest, you know, tr trampling over him probably didn't help. But that was basically creating a situation in order to cause destabilization. It's the same thing where it's going on right now. Funding the gangs to destabilize the area so that you can cause the West to bring in their troops to basically have an iron fist in all of Haiti. Am I showing my age what, with that uh, Lion King reference? I probably am. Anywho, so yes. Now, let's continue. Oop. Okay. It says, what they don't tell you is that these criminal-backed gangs are creations of the system supported by the U.S.-backed oligarchs. They also don't tell you that their invasion is targeted against the only figure fighting against those criminal gangs, Jimmy Barbecue Sherry Zell leader of the G9 Anti-Crime Federation. Now, that's what's going on right now, right? And I'll finish the rest of that tweet in a second. But they don't like that <laughs> barbecue, as he's affectionately called, is actually fighting against the Ariel Henry regime. They don't like that. The West does not like that. So it's Barbecue's gang, really organization, versus the gangs that are being upheld by Ariel Henry. See? See what's going on? Now, let me share with you guys this. This, it, it gets deep. All right. So, who is Jimmy Barbecue Sherry Zell? So, we're going to share, I'm going to share this with you. I shared this a, uh, seven months ago, but I'm going to share it again, and then we'll get back to what else he said. Because I want you guys to see why they see this particular man as a threat in Haiti. TLDR, he reminds you of Eddie Stodd. That's why. Let's get into it. All right. So it says, just a reminder, these are the people that Kenyan police will interact with while in Haiti. So let me share this. It says, this is one of Haiti's most powerful gang leaders. They keep calling him a gang leader. I wonder why. And yes, he also is a former police officer. It says, running the G9 
an alliance of gangs fighting other gangs. So they're fighting for control of the capital. Teddy Zero says some gangs are backed by politicians and business leaders. What did we say earlier? That was said by Miss Monique on Democracy Now. That was also brought up by Dan Cohen. That's also being brought out by Shetty Zer. That the gangs are also being backed by business leaders and politicians in Haiti to keep the area destabilized. Do not let your eyes off these damn people. That's who they are. Now, let's continue. It's unfortunate we have to call some Haitians enemies, but the Haitian oligarchs and politicians give them guns and ammunition to destroy our communities. It says Shady Zaire has been accused of human rights violations and killing civilians. And has been hit with UN sanctions. Now, I want you to I want to ask you this. When it comes to the Viet Cong, when it comes to the Palestinian resistance, aren't they also accused of a lot of the same things? Was it Fidel Castro and the and the rebels in Cuba, the revolutionaries, weren't they accused of the same things? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Let's continue. He insists he's fighting to help provide security and basic services to the people left behind by the government. Sounds like some people I know. There's a difference between a gang and an armed group. We have an ideology. We have a vision to see Haiti with all the services, with drinking water, schools, jobs, and with security. So he basically said, essentially, they're not a gang. But they keep being, they keep calling them that. Why? Because there's a negative connotation with calling black people gangs, because they can do the same thing with Hamas. They can be like, well, that's a gang. They can do the same thing with the Viet Cong. That's a gang. They can do the same thing with the, you know, with when it was taken, when Cuba was, went through the revolution. They can call them the, a gang, but it's always when you look like this, it's like, oh, well, they're organized. Mm, let's just call them a gang. So you see the racism there, too? Racism all up in there, too. Let's continue. Because gang violence has consumed Haiti for the past two years. Says since the assassination of President Jovenel Moise in 2021, have been fighting for control. As the country's prime minister has asked for international assistance to fight the gangs. The PM is not asking for foreign troops to come to the Country. They want foreign forces to protect them from the crimes they have committed. Several times the UN's intervened in Haiti, and you see that the result is always zero. Mm -hmm. It says in the past few weeks, people have turned against the gangs in the country. Now called the new movement, Wakele. Jadizel <laughs> says he supports them and that the time has come. So 
if they are getting rid of the gangs, if the people are getting rid of the gangs and Shelly Zell is basically saying, I, oh yeah, I support that, then is he part of the gangs? Uh, JB, the answer will be no. Because Shetty Zell is literally saying, oh no, I support the people. Yeah, get rid of these gangs. Which means he's not. Which means he's not part of the gang. He's not with them. Which means that his organization isn't a gang. Meaning, it's actually an organization. Lord and Lord, y'all about to put. I'm telling you, man. This for people to fight back. So that's who Shetty Zell is. Now, now, I want to finish this tweet. Hang on. So that's who Jimmy Shetty Zell is. Also affectionately known as Barbecue. So, who does he sound like? Is he just some gang leader that's trying to rule the nation with an iron fist to dominate it? Or... Is he an organization leader trying to put the power back in the people's hands? Now, let's go back to what Dan Cohen was talking about, because I think this is really important, because I want you guys to see and hear what Jimmy said he's there was saying. Now, I'm going to finish this tweet by Dan Cohen. So. says, watch him speak to the huge crowd of supporters about how the ruling class exploits the poor masses. Unlike Shetty Zell, U.S. puppet Ariel Henry is reviled by the people. He can't appear in public, let alone draw a crowd of hundreds of or thousands like Shetty Zell. This is the enemy number one of the U.S. empire in Haiti. Anti-imperialists must resist war propaganda promoted through mass media and defend him and Haitian sovereignty. So I want you guys to hear what he has to say. I'm going to read what he says, and then we'll discuss. He says, let's look at the two Hades, one on top, one on the bottom. Those people will keep us in slavery for 10 or 20 more years. So their children will be the ministers, director general, president, senators, and big entrepreneurs. Hang on. What? Who is that sound? Wait. Who does that sound like? What does that sound like to you? Well, what have we been saying for a while in regards to our politicians in this country? Hmm. So meanwhile, we still have nothing. They'll still need us to go burn tires and do violent demonstrations for them. See, that's the mental revolution that must precede the armed revolution. So basically, essentially, they want them 
to burn tires and do violent revolts so that they, especially the Western corporate media can go, see, see, look at all the violence. We have to put our troops there. We have to send our guys, our boots on the ground there so that we can restore order to that country. Don't you want order to be restored to Haiti? Meanwhile, they're the ones that are sending the weapons to these puppets to fund these gangs that are committing violence in the streets. And yet you have people like the G9 under Jimmy Cerizel that are saying, absolutely not. You guys are not going to continue to destabilize this country. And we're going to restore the things that the people need, like education and water and food and all these things that the people really need. But the West doesn't want that. Says, what the revolutionary forces of the G9 will do, which scares them and makes them call us bandits. He said, it's time to make a difference between gangs, bandits, and people making revolution. So, that's what he is saying. Does he actually sound like a gang leader? Or as uh, I think it was First Post said, they said he was a mafia leader. Does he sound like one of those? Now, I want to share this as well, because Dan Cohen says this too. Dan Cohen says, that clip's an expert from excerpt from Another Vision, a documentary that uh, Kim Ives and I made exposing the US propaganda uh, apparatus has invented massacres and blamed Sherizel to pave the way for the looming invasion. These massacres are Haiti's version of Iraqi WMDs or Syrian chemical weapons attacks, but have been accepted at face value by many, many anti-imperialist groups. Our work debunking them has been ignored by these groups and prominent anti-war news outlets. Resist war propaganda. Watch the documentary series and get the correct information before it's too late. Now, I'm going to be watching this documentary when I get a chance. But uh, I am going to share the link to that documentary in the chat so that you guys have access to it. So there's the documentary there. So you guys can watch it. It's on YouTube. So you guys have that gray zone article and you guys have the documentary. I'm going to have to give that documentary a watch because that actually goes even deeper into the imperialism of the West and in meddling with Haiti. And I think that's really important that we get uh, that historical analysis in as well. So. Always, always, always look at the geopolitical issues by following the money and look at it from an anti-imperialist lens. Of course, the U.S., Canada, and Haiti has this grubby little hands in Haiti as they want to keep control, especially of the people. And, you know... They want to control the people because the people favor more nationalization of resources, and they also favor sovereignty over their country. But as we know, 
the West doesn't want that because they want to keep the resources for themselves. This is no different than the goals of the U.S. in regards to the Cuba, Democratic Republic of Congo, Palestine, Hawaii, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is why it is important to, when we say things like Free Palestine, we're also saying things like Free Congo, Free Sudan, uh, Free Tigray, Free Haiti, Free Hawaii, right? This is why we say things like this. Because ultimately, the freedom is being held back by Western imperialist powers. That's ultimately what they want to do. They, yes, yes, Jeffrey. Imperialist mofos. Basically. And that's exactly what they try to do. And so when people talk about, oh, well, we just need to send troops. No, 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 no troops. It's just like it's just like with Edna Mode and the Incredibles, no capes, no troops. No. In fact, the US needs to get his grubby little hands out of Haiti and let the Haitian people determine for themselves what they want. And if that means ousting somebody like Ariel Henry, then, well, I guess he's going to kick rocks. If that's what the people want, then damn it, let the people have what they want. But you know the West doesn't want to do that. This is why paying attention to movements that are trying to pressure the U.S. government and to bring this into to everybody's attention this is why it's important. Talking about Haiti is not a sexy subject. Especially right now what's going on in Palestine, because everybody's talking about Palestine, which rightfully so. You need to be keep talking about Palestine. But I want you also to talk about Sudan, Congo, right? Haiti. I'm going to try to do some research into Tigray. I want to do some research into them as well. But make sure to always try to keep talking about these countries. Why? Because the U.S., by extension of the West, always wants to try to take over the resources of these countries and then undermine the will of the people. And as people like myself, and I know you that are watching, you stand with the people. So, do not stop talking about Palestine. Start talking about Haiti. Start talking about Congo. Start talking about Sudan. Start talking about Ethiopia. And there's so many other countries out there that we can start talking about. And add that along with what you're talking about Palestine. And let's together start educating ourselves on what's going on in these countries so that we know what's really going on and as always follow the money thank you so very much for watching my channel and i deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart if you wish to support the channel further so i can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon you can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.